Jesus at the center of it all. Hallelujah. God is good. You know, we, we enjoyed ourselves. But you know, when we woke up on su- last Sunday, uh, in that beautiful hotel on S- at St. Andrews, our heart was still back home here. You know, we, we really miss you. We really miss the worship. We, we miss everything here. And we, were, we tried to look for a church, but there was nothing within walking distance of where we were. And uh, so we, we had our own little time back in our room. Uh, we listened to the same sermon that you listened to on YouTube. <laughs> so praise the Lord. We are glad to be back here. And uh, the Lord is good. You know, um, some people ask me, say, Pastor, you travel a lot. Uh, how you prepare sermon? I said, very easy. When I fly, I'm nearer heaven than all of you. <laughs> I'm 36,000 feet above all of you, nearer to God. You know? But that's not true. Uh, but uh, that's, that's not really true. The Lord is always with us all the time, everywhere, wherever we may be. Amen? Hallelujah. And then, um, but one of the things I enjoy sometimes is just, the time uh, in the plane away from everything else and just to hear what the Lord has to say. And, and, and this week was especially good because I, I sort of sorted out in my mind uh, what, how the Abrahamic covenant is related to the Mosaic covenant. And for once, I saw it uh, uh, 36,000 feet above the sea level. <laughs> Amen. And this morning, uh, we want to continue on our series on the New Covenant. And we want to talk about the Mosaic Covenant. What is the Mosaic Covenant? What or sometimes we call the Old Covenant uh, in the Scriptures. Well, we, two weeks ago, we looked at, the, looked at Abraham. And then if you know the story of Abraham, Abraham's son Isaac, and then he had two sons, Jacob and Esau, and how Jacob was the line that the Lord had chosen, and how... Jacob and the family then moved to Egypt because Joseph was sold into slavery in Egypt and Joseph was, had become the prime minister of Egypt. And so the whole family, the family of Abraham moved to Egypt. They were, then they were out of their promised land into Egypt. And we know that they stayed there for 400 years because two weeks ago we also uh, understood that God had prophesied that they will be there for 400 years uh, because the, the sin of the Amorites has not come to f- fruition. Okay? But at the right time, the Lord raised up Moses and led the nation of Israel out of, of Egypt. They went in as a family, you know, but they came out as a big nation of 2-3 million people of, of uh, Egypt. And where were they? Uh, then they came, after two months of travelling in the desert, they came and settled at the foot of Mount Sinai. And that's where the Mosaic Covenant now begins. Okay? So let's just quickly read through this. Exodus chapter 19. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Thus you shall say to the, to who? To the house of Jacob, to the children of Israel. So this covenant that Moses is going to declare over the people of Israel is solely made to the nation of Israel and to no one else. And to no one else. You know, sometimes people... The Americans sometimes think that, wow, God has made a covenant with our nation. No, there's only one nation in the world that God has made this covenant with. The old covenant or the Mosaic covenant was made with the nation of Israel and no one else. So that was a specific covenant for this nation. And we're going to talk a little bit more about why. Well, first of all, the Lord reminded the Israelites, you know, it was about Him. Him saving them, how He has delivered them out of the Egyptian bondage, how He has taken them out of Egypt, and how He has destroyed the Egyptian army uh, in the Red Sea, and how He has just brought them out of slavery to this new place that He's going to take them to. 
So it is the Lord that has delivered them. And why did He deliver them? He has brought them unto Himself. Yeah? How I bore you on eager wings and brought you to Myself. You know, when God takes us out from wherever we may be in, some of us have come out from a, from a whole history, you know, a, a background of idolatry. Some of us have come out from a background of, uh, of drug addiction or whatever it is. But when God brings us out of such backgrounds, it is always to Himself. God wants a personal relationship with us. He wants to bring us to Himself. He has brought us out of eager swings. The, the eagles is one of the greatest birds uh, uh, around. And when the eagle flies up, he's so high up, there's no, no birds down there that can attack the eagle anymore. And he said, I brought you out so that nobody else can touch you. Amen? What a consolation. Amen? Hallelujah. So the real destination of, for the Israelites is God himself. Then he goes on to say, God goes on to tell Moses, he says this, he says, now, therefore, if you indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. So, everybody say, special treasure. Special treasure. So, they shall be a special treasure. What else? And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests. Everybody say, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So what is the promise for Israel? The promise for Israel is that there will be a special people, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. They shall be a very unique group of people. This nation that were the descendants of Abraham will now be that special people, a special treasure for the Lord a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Today, today, we still see how a small nation of this group of Israelites, Israel, Israelites today, they, how the impact and the influence over all the world. Today, we, we, about, you know, of all the Nobel Prize winners, most of them, a big number of them, uh, come from uh, our Jews, uh, our descendants of the Israelites. You know, and they're, they're, they're the way that they control the finances of the world and so many now today, the IT uh, institutions of the world, you know, you, you just boggles your mind how a small group of people can be like that. Why? Because the Lord said that they will be a special treasure, a holy nation unto Him. Amen? Amen. Let's move on. But there are conditions. Uh, unlike in Abraham's time, Abraham's covenant, there were no conditions. But the Mosaic conditions, uh, Mosaic covenant had conditions. He said they must obey his voice. So far in the desert, they have not obeyed him. When they come, in the two months coming out, they were always grumbling. Oh, why you bring us out? Now you bring us to this place to die. Now you bring us to this place we don't have deep water. You know, they're always grumbling. In the desert, they didn't listen to him. So the Lord said, you want to be a special treasure? Now you must listen to me. You must obey my voice. And what is obeying the voice? It begins with the heart to listen and to respond accordingly. And they must keep his covenant. And the covenant that he's going to share with them, the covenant that he's going to give, give to them. So two conditions, obey his voice and keep his covenant. So Moses, hearing all this, so what did Moses do? Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before them all the words, all these words which the Lord commanded him. And what did the people say? The people answered together and said, All that the word the Lord has spoken to has spoken, we will do. So despite all their whining and complaining two months in the two months in the desert, they say, Yes. Yes, we want to be that special people. We want to be that kingdom of priests. We want to be that holy nation that you call us to be. They say yes. Now you say, maybe not fair. I say one time, yes, you, you, you hold me to it. But if you turn back to Exodus, then, then the Lord spoke to them and so on and all the other things. Uh, you, you, you go forward to Exodus chapter 24. They said the same thing. So Moses came and told the, 
people, all the words of the Lord and all the judgments and all the people answered with one voice. All the words which the Lord has said, we will do. And so Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and then he, he, he killed uh, the, the oxen and offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen uh, to the Lord. Then, then in verse 6, he goes on to say, And Moses took the blood, put some, some in basins, and sprinkled some on the altar. And then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people what he had written down. And they said, All that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people. You see, we talk about in Abraham time, blood as uh, the Two sermons ago, we thought how blood is always sometimes uh, used to seal the covenant. So he sprinkled the blood on the people and said, This is the blood of covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. So we find that all they have said three times, all the words which the Lord has said, we will do. Three times so far, they reply in affirmative. And therefore, Moses then affirmed the covenant with a sprinkling of the blood on the altar and on them. So far, okay with you? Huh? The story? Okay. So what then is the Mosaic covenant? Uh, what is then this old covenant that we have been talking about? First of all, we say that it is a covenant that God made with the nation of Israel because He has a special plan for this nation of Israel, which we will look in in a little while. And not the church. Uh, he, he didn't make this with you or me. He made this with the Jews, descendants, blood descendants of Abraham. And this covenant is conditional upon their obedience. They need to obey the Lord. They need to obey His words and obey, uh, follow, keep His covenant. And then, if you read through from Exodus chapter 20 all the way to the end of Deuteronomy chapter 32, I think, then you'll find that the law that we are talking about, the covenant that we are talking about, has something like 613 laws. 613 laws. You know, different things governing all aspects of the, of the Israelites' life. Why? Because the, the, the Israelites have come out of Egypt. They've been there for 400 years. God has took, taken them out of Egypt. But now, God needs to take Egypt out of them. You understand? Huh? So, He has we need to show them who He is and how they are to live and so on. And these 613 laws are to be regarded as a whole. So, I'll come back to that in a while. Um, some people, some people say, you must divide into three parts. There's the moral laws, the Ten Commandments. There's the ceremonial laws about all the festivals and offerings and so on. And then there's the civil law. And then, now, for us, only the moral law applies. The ceremonial and civil laws don't apply anymore. You know, you hear that many times. You know, we are now in the New Covenant. These are the, only the moral law applies. Ceremonial and civil law don't apply. Now, I think that's wrong because the law is treated as a whole. Because James says that if you just break the smallest of each of these, any of these commandments, you have broken the whole law. Amen? And in, and in a very real sense, they are, all these are all tied up together. God has given a whole total framework for the new nation of Israel. They are all integrated and interrelated. For example, so if, for example, if you, if you steal something, uh, because Ten Commandments say, one of the commandments says, you shall not steal, isn't it? So if, if uh, say, where's Yen Chong? If Yen Chong steals something, from, steal one of my sheep, for example, you know, say we are all during that time, he, he steals one of my sheep, so what has, in a, a find out, I catch him, huh? then what must he do? Huh? He has to pay back. Huh? Huh? That's under the civil laws. How many sheep must he pay me back? If he has already, because it's so, he killed already, then he killed the sheep, go for barbecue, then I found out, barbecue, that's my sheep, you know? Ah, so now what, what has he got to do? He has to bring, give me back four sheep. Ah, 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 he has to give me back four sheep. Ah, so the civil law governs that part of it to settle the problem with me. But not just that. Not just that. Then, because he has sinned against the Ten Commandments, ah, thou shalt not steal. 
He has also now to offer a sin offering unto the Lord. You understand what I mean? So all the laws are tied up together in that sense. Huh? It's an integrated whole. You cannot cut off how? Then the Ten Commandments give you no escape. For the Jews, you know, even in law, even in law, the Lord shows grace. Uh, we're going to look at it in a while. Uh, the Lord shows grace. Might as well go into that. Okay? The blood sacrifices. The Lord says that every time you do something wrong against some of these laws, then you offer an offering. And the blood of the animals that you offer covers your sin for the time being. That's what atonement means. Atonement simply means a cover. You know? So when you offer an offering, you cover the sin for the time being. So even in the law, there is grace of God's sin. Amen? Hallelujah. You know? So then there's also in the law, ceremonial laws and, and part of it in the civil law, so-called, uh, there's dietary restrictions. There are some animals that are clean and some unclean. And up to today, some people say, oh, which may not be, which may not be incorrect, but I don't think there's a main reason. Some people say, God is so concerned that the Israelites live well, therefore God say, this one you can eat, this one you cannot eat. And one of the things that you cannot eat is bacon. And one of the things that I love most is bacon. How can, you know? <laughs> so I say, it's not because of all this. What God is trying to say is, is this. God is putting up some dietary restrictions so as to separate out the people of Israel, the nation of Israel from all the other nations. Do you know that today, you know, when we are younger, when we are younger, we live, near, we live in a new village near the kampong and so on. So friends come, they will come and they eat in the house. And then because they don't, they don't, they don't jabba, they dare to come to the house still, we will, we will buy roja and uh, mi robots. My dad will buy roja and mi robots. So my friends, you know, can come in. But today, because of dietary restrictions and all the other restrictions, today you don't find some people coming, able to come to your house for any function. You understand what I'm trying to say? Some people of certain religions won't come. Why? Because of dietary restrictions. Dietary restrictions separate people out. Amen? You understand? Huh? Because they, were, they had special diet, they separate people out. That's why when the, when, when, the word of the, when, the, when the Lord wanted to, the word of the Lord to go to Cornelius, he showed, what did he show Peter? He showed Peter a whole screen of all the unclean food. Isn't it? Peter was, was resting, uh, the Apostle Peter uh, was resting on the rooftop, and he saw the whole screen of unclean food. He said, Lord, how can you ask me to eat all this? Arise and eat. He said, how can you ask me to eat all this? Say, no, what all that I make clean is clean for you now. You know, that dietary restriction serves a purpose to fence up. This, this morning, it, communion, talk about, to fence up a people to be separated from other people, not to be polluted by other people. But now, that is now open in the new covenant. Hallelujah! Amen! And that's one of the greatest things I want to say today, okay? Uh, I have great liberty in eating all the bacon in the house. <laughs> you know, nothing to stop us. Right? Amen? The dietary restrictions, clean and unclean, no more there. There are other reasons why clean and unclean, but I believe one of the main ones is to separate out the nation to be a holy nation, the Lord. The death penalty, you realize that in the, in, the, in the law, the death penalty goes on to include more than just murder for adultery, for adultery, for cursing God, for breathing, breaking the Sabbath, for witchcraft and so on. Why? God, what God is trying to say is, now you are a separate nation to myself. Now, if all these people come in, all these people who commit adultery with their Amorites or their Moabites come in, then you have to kill them to, to clear them out so that the nation remains basically pure. You understand what I'm trying to say? Okay? So, that's, that's what's happening uh, in the Mosaic Covenant. To separate out, remember, God said that you will be for me a special treasure, a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. To separate out a nation for Himself. Then there is a Sabbath too. A sign between God and Israel alone. You see, all the way from Adam, uh, from the creation, all the way until Exodus, uh, until somewhere after, after the Passover, uh, there was no, 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 the, nobody was asked to observe the Sabbath. But 
from, but for the nation of Israel, the Lord asked them to observe this Sabbath. And Sabbath is not really a day of worship. Uh, Sabbath is a day of prohibition, what you cannot do so that you be com- learn to be at rest. And it's again to show separation now. So this nation, one day a week, doesn't do anything. They are at rest so that they are separate, different from other nations. Amen? And then circumcision uh, gives you... They were, so one of those things that they're supposed to do is to circumcise all the males. And, they, and this, is, this is carried forward from uh, Abraham's time to show us the link between uh, the Mosaic Covenant and the Abrahamic Covenant. So what is the purpose of the Mosaic Covenant or the Mosaic Law? Well, we have said it many times already. I hope by now you get it. That it is primarily to prepare Israel to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So we have said it that God has taken Israel out of Egypt. Now they have been there 400 years. They learned all the wrong things about God. Uh, they, in fact, none of them actually had any personal relationship with God. None of them know who is this Yahweh that they are worshipping. They, they have no understanding of His character. They have no understanding of His ways. They have no understanding of His heart. You know? So the Mosaic Covenant, all the different laws that were there, was to reveal God's holiness and righteousness. What the sort of standard that God demanded of them. And so, as a result, to keep the Jews, as I said at different times, uh, a distinct nation, a distinct nation with very distinct religious practices, with very, very high moral standards, with very clear, clear civil laws. You know, for all the other nations around, they always had a king. The only thing that the nation knew, all the other nations knew was this, very simple, might is right. Because I'm king, if I want to take your wife, I just take your wife. You know? I want to take your land, I want to take your ship, I just take your ship. Might is right. So, so, but then, God now has come out with, a, with this, brought out this nation, raised up this nation with a completely different set of civil laws that respect the rights of the poor, that respect the rights of the, of the fringe, people on the fringe, people who are weak, and so on. And, and, and govern, give it laws to govern that is not just might is right. You understand what I'm trying to say? Amen? Okay, so what is the purpose of the Old Covenant or the Mosaic Covenant? Is to prepare the nation of Israel to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Well, Paul has this to say in Galatians 3. He says, What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions until the seed should come to whom the promise was made. It was either because the people didn't know what was right. They, they were all in transgressions. It was either so that they would prepare them until the seed, the seed that was promised in Genesis chapter 3 and then in, in Genesis chapter 12 through Abraham, that in you will be the blessing for all the families of the earth. The seed, until the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Paul goes on in verse 24 to say, Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. The law was also for this purpose that it's a tutor to show us how far short we have fallen of God's standards. God demands complete righteousness, 100% holiness, separation. And then the law is to show us like a mirror to show us how, like a tutor, like a school teacher to show us that we cannot meet God's requirements by ourselves. We need Jesus Christ to save us and to enable us to be accepted by God. Amen? Hallelujah. So what then is the connection between the Abrahamic and the Mosaic Covenant? Well, already as we said, because they were descendants of Abraham, they are blessed. Because they were Jews, they are blessed. You know, they are blessed. They are blessed people. You know? They are already blessed. The Abraham covenant has three major parts. That they have put five, but really, if you condense it further, there are three major parts. Okay? God promised Abraham a land. He said he will make him a great nation. 
You will be a blessed nation and there will be a nation that is, that is famous with a great name. In fact, when they came out, came out of Egypt, the Egyptians initially uh, don't think very much about them. But when, when nations all around realized how the whole Egyptian army was drowned in the Red Sea, then everybody realized how great a nation Israel, the Israelites were. Amen? So they had a great name. And then the third part of it was that out of the seed of Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So land, the Lord has already taken the Abraham to that land and now bringing back the nation of Israel to the same land again. So land is settled already. They went to Egypt as a family, but now they are a big nation coming out of Egypt, going back to their land. Now, the only one thing that is left is the seed that has to come from it. And that's what Paul in Galatians 3 talked about just now. Okay? Until the promised seed will come. So how do you bless all the families of the earth? So, the Mosaic Covenant completes one, that one third part of the Abrahamic Covenant. It is to prepare the nation of Israel for the coming Messiah. There will come the seed that will crush Satan's feet, uh, Satan's head. Uh, the, the feet of this, of this promised seed will crush Satan's head. And this is a promised Messiah that will come. And the nation of Israel needs to be prepared for it. That because out of this nation will come the promised seed. Out of the nation of Israel will come the saviour of the world. And they need to know who is this God they're worshipping. What is his heart all about? What, is, what are his standards? You know? And so the Mosaic Covenant reveals that to us. Why? Because Christ has to be born under the law, Paul tells us. He has to keep the law and fulfill the law and so that because he fulfilled the law, all the blessings of God under the law will now be released to all the families of the world. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. You know, so why was the why was why the need for the Mosaic Covenant? So that they, the nation will be prepared. And out of that nation will come Jesus Christ. And he, the promised seed, will be the one that will bring release the blessings because of what he has done, will release the blessings to the families of the world. Amen? And this is a very famous verse. And, and people always use it. And I, I want to just spend a little bit of time on this. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Jesus, at the Mount of, uh, at the Mount of Beatitudes, gave this sermon. Uh, among other things, he said, Do not think that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one job or one tittle will by no means pass from the law until all is fulfilled. Okay? Just again to emphasize this point, he says, no jolt, that means one, one dot, no tittle, one little slash, uh, will pass away until the whole law is fulfilled. So basically he says, it simply means this, if you want to obey the law, if you insist that you want to obey the law, that the way to God is obeying the law, then you must keep all of them. Amen? Because you cannot keep some and then leave one small dot here, small, small comma there, don't keep. You have to keep the whole law. Uh, and if the law is in the effect, because not one of them will pass away until they are all fulfilled, so then the penalties for the law will still be in effect. Amen? Uh, so we have to be watch out. So we have to be very clear about this. Has the law been fulfilled? Has, if the law is not fulfilled and we have to keep it, then we have to keep the whole law, including cannot eat, uh, cannot eat uh, bacon, uh, cannot eat yoba. Uh. So, so, so if you insist on keeping them, you have to keep all of them. Otherwise, the penalties are still in place. <clears throat> what was Jesus trying to do on the Sermon Amount? Jesus was challenging the Pharisees' interpretation of the law. On the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was challenging them. He's saying that 
you have destroyed the law, not me. You have destroyed the law. Why? Because you wrongly interpreted it. You focus only on the external, what people can see. You never talk about what is inside you, what people cannot see. But God's standards are different. He's talking about everything. See, cannot see, also, uh, also must obey uh, completely. Uh, you have destroyed the law. You have watered it down to suit your, your, yourselves. You have watered down the law to suit yourself. You say it's okay as long as you, know, you, you, you look at a pretty woman and undress her in your mind, uh, uh, as long as you don't touch her or as long as you don't, you know, uh, go to bed with her, whatever it is, you have watered it down to suit yourself. Uh, but Jesus said, by doing so, what have you done? You have destroyed the law. Don't say I have destroyed the law. You have destroyed the law. Jesus is telling the Pharisees, you have destroyed the law. And I have come to fulfill the law. I have come to fulfill the law. What does it mean to fulfill the law? To fulfill it means to bring it to completion, to bring it to pass, to bring it to the end. I fulfill the law. I have done all that the law is what, what the law requires, I've done it. I, I fulfill the law in that I, 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 I've done all that what the law is about, I've done it. Amen? So Jesus said, I come to fulfill the law, to bring it to pass, to bring it to an end. Now I want to suggest to you that Jesus is the fulfillment of all the Messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. We have no time to go into all the details, but he, in all the prophecies, you know, because he said, come, do not think that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. Huh? So we're just looking at the prophets part of it. He has to fill all the Messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. He is the promised seed that will crush the serpent's head. He is the Messiah that will save the people from their sins. He is the coming king who will usher in the kingdom of God. Amen? Okay. So we're going to look at how Jesus fulfilled the law uh, in a little while. Okay, first of all, I want to look at one part of it, which is called the moral law. Okay? Uh, Jesus fulfilled the moral requirements of the law completely, externally, and internally. Okay? He, he was completely sinless. He, every part, he, he holds no grudges. He is not simply angry. He is, he is sinless. Uh, he, did not, he did not break any of the laws extern externally or internally. He lived a sinless life. And I want to suggest to you, not just a sinless life, but a representative. His sinlessness was a representative sinlessness. Why? Because he's son of God, uh, as also son of man. He lived a sinless life, but his sinless life uh, can become ours. Okay? His obedience, the Bible tells us, becomes our obedience. His law keeping becomes our law keeping. Amen? That's the good news of the scriptures. Huh? That's the good news of the gospel. That whatever Jesus did to fulfill the law can become our fulfillment when we trust in what he has done for us on the cross and in, in his resurrection. Amen? Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Huh? So Jesus fulfilled all the moral requirements of the law. He kept the whole Ten Commandments perfectly. And because He kept it perfectly and we trust in what He has done for us, we become in Christ, fulfilling the law. Amen? Hallelujah. Jesus fulfilled all the ceremonial requirements of the law. Circumcision, He was circumcised on the eighth day. He was baptized. John didn't want to baptize. He said, no, baptize me so that all righteousness may be fulfilled. He kept the Sabbath. He went, he, went, he went with his parents for the different pilgrimages to, to uh, Jerusalem. You know, on the Passover, he went to Jerusalem for the Passover when he was 12 years old. But really, if you read carefully, the gospel said that as it was their custom. That means before Jesus was 12 years old, the parents were also going to Jerusalem. And Jesus was also with them there, going to Jerusalem. Amen? Hallelujah. He fulfilled all the ceremonial requirements of the law. He didn't go against it. You know, when he healed the leper, he said, show yourself to the priest you know, uh, so that they will certify that you're completely clean. You know, he fulfilled all the ceremonial requirements of the law. But more than just that, I want to suggest to you also 
that Jesus was the reality of all the old covenant shadows. You know, we talk about the Passover just now at, at, uh, at, at Holy Communion. The, the Passover, the blood over the doorpost. Jesus was the lamb that was slain for us. The Passover lamb, the lamb of God that was slain for us. We talk about the tabernacle and all the different furniture of the tabernacle. They all point to Jesus. All the festivals where they pass over, uh, first fruits. He is the first fruit from the dead, you know. He is uh, Pentecost and how he is the one that, that pours down his spirit upon us, you know. So all the festivals, the Sabbath, uh, we talk about keeping Sabbath, yet we find that in the end, Jesus is our Sabbath. The high priest, he is not just a sacrifice, but he is also the high priest. And all the different garments, uh, I, uh, items of the garments are just pictures of Jesus for us. So, this, all these were shadows. And what did they do? They all point to Jesus and His finished work. Jesus fulfilled the ceremonial laws, not just, by, just, just following them, but He was also the reality of the old covenant shadows. Amen? Jesus also fulfilled the requirements of the civil laws in the old covenant. So the civil laws required, we mentioned earlier, Restitution and retribution. Okay, there is as if you still if you still a ox, I think it's you got to pay back five times. I'm not sure why, but you still a sheep, pay back four times. Huh? so uh, there is restitution and there is re- retribution. You pay back what you have stolen, and then you there is retribution. That means the penalty for doing so. Okay, how how does that apply to us? Well. Jesus kept the law on our behalf. There's restitution. He, 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 he did what was necessary. We broke the law. He kept the law for us. Now what else did He do? He took the punishment for us. There's retribution upon Him. He fulfilled the law, the, 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 the civil law of the old covenant in totally. Amen? On the cross, He also kept the law. I want to give you one example of an Old, old Testament shadow. Deuteronomy chapter 28, uh, verse 18. It talks about if a man, you know, you know, man and wife has a son that is rebellious and stubborn. And because he's rebellious and stubborn, don't the work, he's always drunk. Huh? He's always drunk and he's a glutton. Huh? Okay? Then that, that husband and wife, that man and wife, they can take him before the elders at the gate. And if the elders agree with the, with the man and wife, they will stone, them, stone that son dead and then they'll hang him on a tree. Okay. Now many people read this and say, oh yeah, so cruel. Huh? How can the God of the Old Testament be so cruel? No, really, what, what is that? It's but a picture, a shadow of what Jesus really did for us. You remember Matthew, Matthew chapter 11? Jesus said that, John did not come drinking and drink, uh, did not come eating and drinking, and they say he has a demon, isn't it? Huh? Say, but the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say call him a drunkard and a glutton. And then Paul in Galatians three says that he who knew became a curse for us because he was hung on a tree. Now he put the two together, you see. The good son is but a picture of what Jesus has done for us. The good son of the father took the place of us disobedient sons who deserved the death penalty. He took the place of us. He became labored as a drunkard and a glutton and became a curse for us on the tree. What a beautiful picture of the fulfillment of the civil law in the old covenant. Amen. So Jesus did not destroy the law. He came to fulfill it by His life, <coughs> His teaching, His death and resurrection. He came to fulfill the law. And when He fulfilled the law, what happened then? He became the source of blessings, not just to Israel, but to all families of the earth who trust in Him. Hallelujah. You know, because he fulfilled the law, then he now, 
all the blessings that the Lord had promised to the Israelites in the old covenant and, and become available for us. Therefore, today, we can read Deuteronomy chapter 28 in a completely different light. Deuteronomy chapter 28, we start from verse 2 for time's sake. Huh? So, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because why? You obey the voice of the Lord your God. Who obeyed for us? Jesus obeyed for us. And because He obeyed for us, some of these blessings will come upon us? No. All these blessings will come upon us. Hallelujah! Amen! You know, all these blessings will come upon us. And not just come upon us, will overtake us. Hallelujah! You know, the Lord is so good. Every time, if, if we begin to understand this and look at your life now, and you begin to appreciate it more, that how His blessings now can overtake us. You know, in May this year, we went for a holiday. The family went, uh, I went for a conference and then stayed back for a holiday. The rest of the family went for a holiday. Some of you know this already, but just, just to illustrate this. You know, when we planned for it, we didn't know what Malaysian Airlines was going to do, okay? Uh, we only say we want to go these days because I'll be in the US, the rest of the family can, can join later and so on. And so when we went there, then when my children went to, then I had, I had quite a lot of uh, mile, miles, you know, enriched miles all, over all these years and say, okay, whatever we can, we use the miles to get everybody an economy ticket to fly to US, to fly to KL, LA and back. And then when they went, when they went to MAS, that was sometime October last year. And late October last year, they said, Oh, can you wait two more days to book? Because on the 1st of November, we are giving a special offer. You know, for slightly less number of miles. I can't remember exactly what. I think for economy tickets, 80,000 miles or something like that. But for 60,000 miles now, you can get a business class ticket. Something like that. Huh? And so, we had... We already had enough for everybody to go on economy class. Now we have enough for everybody to go on uh, business class, including all the grandchildren. Uh, they all flew business class to US and back. You know, God has overtaken us. His blessings have overtaken us. Even without us knowing, even without us planning, we are happy already. We've got enough miles to go. Everybody economy class. Of course, spoil them. Lah. Now, now my granddaughter said, Grandpa, when are we going for the next holiday? I want to fly business class. <laughs> I say, you ask your father in heaven. <laughs> okay, so all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Amen. And blessed shall you be in the city and blessed shall you be in the country. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter where you are. You may be at home. In, uh, as a housewife, you may be in, in the tallest building in town trying to close a deal. Does not matter where you are, you will be blessed. Amen. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, the produce of your ground, the increase of your herds, the increase of your cattle, and the offspring of your flocks. You know, the Lord promises us that, that we will be fruitful in every way. Amen. That's why we're having this, this, this seminar in October talking about the fruitfulness of God. Amen? That we will be fruitful in every way. That our bodies will be fruitful. We will produce many children. Huh? Beat Mahathir's standards, okay? <laughs> uh, the produce of your ground. Huh? And the increase of herd. Whatever we may be doing, you know. Uh, not just fiscally, just produce of the ground, but whatever businesses that we may be in. I want to declare over all of us that you will be blessed. There will be an increase of the produce of your ground, and there will be an increase of your herds. Hallelujah! Amen! Whatever business that we may be in, there will be many more customers coming in. The business will grow. Hallelujah! The word is increase. Amen? You, there will be an increase. Say, blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. You know, basket, what you, how, you collect your, your, how, how you collect and bring back your... Your, your income will be blessed. And what you do with your income will also be blessed. Hallelujah. You know, blessed in every way. Whether blessed coming in or going out. Whether you're traveling or staying at home, it will be a blessed time together. Amen? Hallelujah. The blessing the Lord shall come upon you and overtake you. Hallelujah. And not just that, 
the Lord will cause your enemies to rise against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come up against you one way and flee from you seven ways. Hallelujah. You know, I don't know what is the enemy that is coming against you. It could be the world economic situation. It could be, you know, a falling currency of Malaysia. It could be uh, the, the poor, uh, poor property sales because of uh, the bank not wanting to give loans. It doesn't matter what the enemy is. It could be a health issue that you're having. It could be something that's troubling you in your body. They, the Lord says, these enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. You know, hey, glory to God. Amen. The Lord will command the blessing on you in your storehouses and all to which you set your hand. And He will bless you in the land which the Lord is giving you. The Lord says that He will command the blessing on you in your storehouses. What are your storehouses? Whatever your bank accounts, whatever your inventory, whatever stocks you have, whatever else talents that you have in, in you, your, your storehouse could also be what the Lord has put in you, in your person. The Lord says He will bless them. He will command the blessing upon you in that. And then there will be an increase. And in all that you set your hands to do. Some of us are saying, oh, Pastor, you talk like that. You know, you can go to St. Andrews and play God, but I feel struggling to find what, what to do with my car that is broken down, or what to do with <coughs> my rent payment that has not come in, you know, and so on and so on. But I want to say to you, look to what the Lord has, has done for you on the cross. And because you, when you look to Him, then He releases. He says, the word of the Lord is true. He says He will command the blessing on you. He will command the blessing on you. In your storehouses, all you to which you set your hand, and He will bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Amen? He will bless you. And I'm, I'm so glad that every week, every week, I hear testimonies of how the Lord is blessing our people. Different ones, in different ways. Some in mega ways, some in small ways. Some of us are still struggling with certain problems but we hold on to what the Lord has promised us. He will command a blessing in us, in our storehouses, and all to which we set our hands to do. What has you, the Lord, called you to do? What are you doing now? The Lord said, He will bless the work of your hands. Amen? And then to the group as a whole, the Lord said, He will establish you as a holy people to Himself, as a people separated unto Himself. Just as He has sworn to you, if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in His ways. And we know that we have, Jesus has kept it for us. He has, uh, and because He has kept it for us, today in Him, we have, we have kept those commandments. And because He is in, is in us, His Spirit is in us, He does Holy Spirit enables us always to walk in His ways. Amen? Amen. Then all the peoples of the earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord and they shall be afraid of you. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, one of the greatest testimonies that we can show the rest of the world is how wonderful a Jesus we have in our midst. He, he clears the path for us. He opens doors for us. He blesses us, you know, with good health, with, with, with prosperity. He, he blesses, he, he makes sure that we are never in want, you know. And when people understand this, they will be afraid of us. Not the afraid in the sense they're scared of you. They will be in awe of the Jesus that is in us. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And you know, what I like about this is Moses didn't stop there. Already, already you feel overwhelmed you know, by all the blessings of the Lord. You know? Moses didn't stop there. Moses goes on to say, and the Lord will grant you plenty of goods in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, and in the produce of your ground, in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. Again, he said, there is always an abundance. Jesus said, I come to give you life. Life in all its abundance. In every sense of the word. In the fruit of your body, increase your livestock, produce of your ground. Not just that, not just enough to bless you like that. The Lord says, He will open to you His good treasures, the heaven, to give the rain to your, to your land in season and to bless all the work of your hand. 
You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. Hallelujah! Amen? We will have so much that we can lend to people, we can give to people, and we can lend to others. Amen? And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You shall be above only and not be underneath. Hallelujah. You know, the Lord is not just concerned that we just be prosperous and healthy in ourselves. But the Lord says that He wants to raise up among many of us here, all of us here, to be leaders in different ways, in whatever fields that we may be. He said, He will make you the head, not the tail. You know the head leads, isn't it? The tail don't lead. Huh? The tail follow the head. Okay? So He will make you the head and not the tail. You shall be above. You shall be above the circumstances of your life. Whatever circumstances the world may be in, in a good time, you will rise up higher. In a lousier time, in a bad time, you still be above the circumstances. Amen? Hallelujah. The Lord says, He will make you the head and not the tail, and you shall be above only and not beneath. Hallelujah. You know, God is good. Why? All this why? Because Jesus fulfilled the law. Everybody say, Jesus fulfilled the law for me. And today, we can receive all that He has for us. Amen? Amen. Let's all rise. I want you to just stretch out your hands as a cup or up, whatever way you want. But in, in a posture of receiving from the Lord. Maybe you have missed out some things in life so far. Maybe it's financial. Uh, you, you have missed out finances, the financial blessings of the Lord so far. Maybe you have missed out the, 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 the blessing of the Lord in terms of uh, produce of your body, fruit of your body, uh, having more children. Or maybe you have missed out having, uh, being, being the head. Uh, you, you have always been second or third. But today, I want you to lift, lift up your hands and receive these blessings of the Lord. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I just thank you, Lord, Lord, for all that Jesus has done for us on the cross, that today, Lord, we can receive, Lord. We can be more than conquerors, Lord, and receive all that He has won for us, all the victory that He has won for us on earth here. We thank you, Lord, that He has fulfilled, Lord, the law, so that the law no longer disqualify us, but because He fulfilled the law, we are now qualified to receive in Him and through Him all that you have for us as your people. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, today. We can stand up and declare that we are your precious treasure, Lord. We are your kingdom of priests, O Lord. Lord, that we are a holy people unto you. And we are blessed because of Jesus. And we receive, O Lord, whether it's the fruit of our bodies, O Lord, whether it's financial blessing, O Lord, whether, Lord, there's an opening, O Lord, for us to a new life, O Lord, the gateway to a new life, whatever it is, O Father, we receive all that you have for us. We receive all that Jesus has released upon, upon us, O Father. We receive it, O Lord. And then we give us expectant hearts, O Lord, from today and onwards, today onwards, O Lord, to see, Lord, the fruit of all that you have of the blessings that you have put upon us. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, Amen, Amen, Hallelujah.